All right, heart part one. The first question's an easy one. What's the function of the heart? Durr, y'all knew that. Uh, which body cavities can you find it in? So this one goes back to stuff we learned the first time back in AMP1. So of course we are in the ventral body cavity, which is all the red stuff. We are in the thoracic cavity, which is everything above the diaphragm. We're in the mediastinum, which is all the central stuff. And then we're in the pericardial cavity, which is the serous membrane that goes around the heart. Um, explain all the layers of the pericardium. So this picture from your book does that really well. So first we got this layer of connective tissue that's called the fibrous pericardium. That basically helps to anchor and keep things where it's supposed to be. That is not the serous part, it is connective tissue. Then we get the serous membrane pericardium. So remember all serous membranes are always two layers. We've got the parietal layer that is more superficial and we have the visceral layer that is more deep. In between those two, we have the fluid-filled cavity in between. Remember that we're going to have serous membranes around the heart, the lungs, and then the entire abdominal pelvic cavity. So we're going to see that popping up over and over again. Always parietal layer, fluid-filled space, and then the visceral layer. The visceral layer of the pericardium is also called the epicardium because got to make things more complicated in the world of AMP. So had to have multiple names just for fun. So that's what we've got going on here. Um, overall function of the pericardium is to reduce friction because the heart's moving all day, every day. We don't want it rubbing up against the sternum. And so that fluid-filled sac is helping to make sure that that does not happen. Um, pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium. Um, there's lots of reasons why that might happen. The treatment will vary depending on why that is happening. Here in this scan, we've got the arrows pointing at the areas where there's inflammation in the pericardium. Um, pericardium is usually pretty painful. People will describe it as a burning sensation or feeling like sandpaper whenever the organ is moving around. Um, if it is the result of a bacterial infection, we're going to treat it with antibiotics. We will sometimes use uh, steroids or just pain relievers for other forms. Um, tamponade or cardiac tamponade. This is a usually a side effect of an open heart surgery that has happened. Um, we'll go in surgically to put in like a stent or do a bypass or whatever, and then there will be fluid buildup within the pericardial cavity. The issue here is there's not a lot of room for that fluid to build up, and so what will happen is it will put pressure on the heart itself, and that will prevent the heart from filling with blood like it's supposed to, which means the heart will not be able to pump blood, because of course if you can't fill, you can't pump. So this is a life-threatening complication that follows heart surgeries. Um, if you are ever in the ICU and it's your job to be checking on patients, if you ever hear the heart sound start to sound muffled, it's time for you to go get a doctor and it's probably time for us to go in and do some more surgeries um, or at least do what's known as a pericardiocentesis, which is where they draw that fluid out so that the heart can fill with blood again. Um, this is one of those times where you got to trust your instincts because, again, life-threatening. we got to make sure that that gets treated. Okay. Layers of the heart itself. When you go in to dissect your heart and lab, the epicardium will still be present. Remember, that is the same as the visceral pericardium. It's just the outside sort of slippery layer around the heart itself. The myocardium. Remember, anytime you see myo, that means muscle. So this is the cardiac muscle that makes up the bulk of the heart itself. When you think of the heart as a pump, this is the pump of the heart. It took me that long to remember to bring my microphone closer to me. So, yay, it should be louder now. Um, the heart does also have a fibrous connective tissue skeleton to help maintain the shape of the heart. Um, these anchor the valves as well. And so this is, you will never see it because it's, you know, in between the muscle layer, but it is in there and helping to maintain the shape of the heart. Next. Okay, so this white line right here that I'm now sort of coloring in yellow, that's the epicardium. This light pink here, myocardium. This, well, they're actually doing it way off in here. So I guess they're still calling this the myocardium as well. This is not a fantastic picture. But anyway, this is the endocardium. It is what lines the inner chambers, the atria and the ventricles. Um, it is a nice, nice smooth layer. It helps to make sure that blood's not going to stick to anything, form clots inside the heart. Mm -hmm the chambers of the heart itself. So we are mammals. Mammals have four chambered hearts. That is two superior atria, 
two inferior ventricles. The atria are receiving chambers, so blood comes into the heart via the atria. Atrium is singular, incidentally. Um, the ventricles are the actual pumps that pump blood out into circulation. Um, they have a standard, you know, ventricle, ventricle, singular, plural thing going on. Um, there, oh yeah, I do want to leave that note, so thank you. Thank you, me, for putting the note up there. So, whenever you dissect the heart in lab, you're going to do a frontal cut through the heart. And when they test you over the heart, they can do the front section of the heart or the back section of the heart which means sometimes the right section will be on the right side, sometimes the left section will be on the right side. So you can't remember like right is backwards. So the way that you need to remember it is that the left side of the heart is always going to have the thicker muscle layer. We'll talk a little bit about why that is later on, but the wall on the left side is much thicker than the wall on the right side. So when you see the heart for the first time, one of the first things you wanna do is figure out which side has the thicker wall. Then you know this must be the left side. Once you know the left side, then top is atrium, bottom is ventricle, every time without fail. So this is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. And since that's the left side, that means this is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle. Um, skipping past that. Okay. Anytime you see the word septum, remember that means wall. So there's a wall between the two atria and there's a wall between the two ventricles. The wall between the atria is called the interatrial septum. Um, one of the special things about that particular septum is that in a fetus, that wall has a hole in it. It's called the foramen ovale. Um, it is a bypass that allows the blood to skip the lungs because of course a fetus is not using the lungs yet. As you develop, that hole is supposed to close up and it leaves sort of a, a thin spot, a weak spot in the wall. And you can still see that even in adults, it's called the fossa ovalis. The wall between the two ventricles is called the interventricular septum. And you can see that they didn't call it inter in this picture, just ventricular, but yeah, this is the interventricular septum. Um, the interatrial septum is almost always hidden behind vessels in the various pictures, but it's, it's in here, it's just behind the vessels. Um, did it, did it, did it. Okay, oracles. So whenever you get your heart out of the bag or bucket or however they stored the hearts in the AMP lab, there are these little flappy things on the superior aspect of the heart. Those little flappy things are called oracles. Essentially, the atria are sort of like deflated balloons. The oracles are the the deflated little flabby balloons that allow the atria to fill up with blood. So that helps you figure out where your atria are going to be. That's going to be relevant because again, what I mentioned earlier is you guys are going to be doing a frontal section through the heart. When you see a heart for the first time, you might think, okay, well maybe this is a frontal section. Nope, if you do that, you're gonna be cutting right through those septa that we just talked about a second ago, and you're gonna miss all four chambers and all, well, actually will cut through at least one of the valves if you cut through that way. That's not how you wanna do it. Instead, you wanna cut through both of the auricles straight down. Um, you're gonna be doing a frontal section. And so once you find the oracles, now you know this is right, this is left, and now you can cut through both of those, not in between them, but through both of them. All right, once you cut into the heart, you're able to see that there's different kinds of muscle in different places. So up in the atria, there are these little stringy muscles the atria don't have to pump all that hard to pump the blood from here to here. Like that doesn't take a lot of effort. So you just get these little strings of muscles up there in the atria. Up there, it's called pectinate muscle. I uh, mentioned the fossa ovalis earlier. That's the weak spot in the wall, the interatrial septum. You can see it in that picture. It marks the place where that foramen ovale used to be in the fetal heart. Got to turn the page. Um, which three vessels empty into the right atrium? So you got the superior and the inferior vena cava. Those are the biggest and the easiest to see, and they're the two that everybody usually remembers. There is also, however, a smaller vessel that's coming in from the posterior aspect of the heart. It's called the coronary sinus. Um, you can see it labeled in this picture. It's this sort of big, swollen, veiny looking thing. Um, that's what a sinus actually is. It's also going to be draining blood into the right atrium. Um, just so you can see that in the cartoony form, there's the sinus right there. 
um, which vessels empty blood into the left atrium? That would be the pulmonary veins. Your book always shows four. Some people have different numbers. Uh, four is about average, though. All right, after that, I gave you this picture where you're labeling just the external anatomy of the heart. Um, and this is where I'm going to just apologize for my crappy handwriting, but you guys are used to my crappy handwriting at this point, probably. Okay, so I'm going to start actually at this vessel right here. The line is right here. That's the aorta. It is, well, you could call it the largest vessel, but it depends on how you're defining largest. It has the largest lumen. The blood is under the highest pressure in that vessel. It's a very large vessel. Um, it has multiple parts. There's an ascending aorta, an aortic arch, a descending aorta, a thoracic aorta, an abdominal aorta. It's a, it's a longish vessel. It's not the longest in your body, but it's fairly long. At the top of the aorta, you have three nubs that come off, and some of them are going to be really short and branch off and become other vessels. Some of them are going to be longer. It just kind of depends. The first one of those, which is going to be this line right here, that is going to be the brachiocephalic artery. And just look at the horrible handwriting. Brachiocephalic is trying to tell you what it's going to do. Brachio means arm, cephalic means head. It is going to split into a vessel that's going to go to the arm and another vessel that's going to go to the head. And I'm just going to abbreviate artery with A. Okay, next one. This is the left common carotid artery. Next one is the left subclavian. Ooh, my handwriting. You poor people, I feel for you. Okay. This little thing of connective tissue marks a place where there used to be a shunt between the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit and a fetus, another one of those places where we were going to bypass the lungs. At this point, in an adult heart, it's just some connective tissue. Um, it's called the ligamentum. Don't be weird. Ligamentum. It skipped the G. Why are you doing that? Luckily, you guys have a picture in your book. Arteriosum. Arteriosum. Oh, I feel like I should just stop because this is just horrible handwriting. Okay. Next up, we got the left pulmonary artery. Left pulmonary veins. This is the left auricle, which marks where the left atrium is. Okay, now the vessels on the surface of the heart do have different names. Um, we are generally speaking not going to be coronary surgeons and so or cardiothoracic surgeons is the name for that. So if it's a red vessel on the surface of the heart, we're just going to call it a coronary artery. Okay, um, this marks where the left ventricle is. Blue vessels on the surface of the heart are called cardiac veins. This is one of a few times where the arteries and the veins don't have the same name. Um, most of the time they do, surface of the heart is just one of the times where they don't. Um, this is the apex of the heart. This is the inferior vena cava. Don't get weird on me. This is the right ventricle. This is the pulmonary trunk. It's going to split into the two pulmonary arteries. Um, the next little lineup is the ascending aorta. Um, then superior vena cava. If there's not a line to this, I might want to go ahead and add it. That is the right pulmonary artery. Hopefully that's all the lines. Yeah, you did have a line to the right pulmonary artery, so glad I added a line to that one. I'm looking to see if I skipped any other lines. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. Um... Right oracle. 
Oh, uh, right pulmonary veins. I skipped that. Okay, I think I got everything else there. Oh, that looks horrible. I'm just going to apologize for horrible handwriting when I write on the computer. Sorry, guys. Your book at least does have cleaner pictures. That's the best I can tell you there. Okay. Next up. Um, frontal section through the heart. Um, you guys will almost guaranteed not cut your heart and make it look this pretty. It is very difficult to cut the heart so that you can actually see all four chambers and all four valves. Um, so if you manage to do that, bravo as you go through there. Now, a lot of the things that are on this picture were on the last picture as well. So you can still see ascending aorta, aortic arch. You can still see brachiocephalic artery, left common carotid, left subclavian. You can still see the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary trunk, blah, blah, blah. What I'm going to do is just label the new stuff that you could not see in the preceding picture. And you guys can add the other stuff later. This is just so that I don't have to abuse you with my horrible handwriting, I guess, on other things. Okay, so before you could see oracles. Now we can actually see inside in the chambers. And so this is the left atrium. And again, how do I know that's the left? Thicker wall on that side. Okay, um, you can still see the left pulmonary veins. We can now see valves that we could not see before. This valve is the bicuspid. Usually when a doctor talks about that, they call it the mitral valve. That's M-I-T-R-A-L valve. Um, it is also sometimes called the left atrioventricular valve or left AV valve for short. Um, these little butt cheek looking things, that is the aortic semilunar valve. And that's valve. Um, next line down, pulmonary semilunar valve. I am never going to fit that on one line. Semilunar valve. Okay. Next line down is the left, go away, ventricle. Oh, this is horrible. Left ventricle. Okay. Now we can see some muscles that we could not see before. I'm actually going to start. So one of the things that we had labeled earlier, talked about earlier, was pectinate muscle. So here's where you can see those little stringy muscles that we had talked about on a preceding slide. It's in the atrium, just little strings of muscle. The ventricles are much bigger. The muscles are much chunkier. So you end up with these little ridges of muscle down in the ventricles that have a really horrible name. It is called trabeculae carnae. I'm going to try to write neat. Trabeculae carnae. Trabeculae carnae is still sort of stringy, but it's thicker strings and it's not attached to anything. Okay. The last kind of muscle that you get is attached to these little strings. So notice we've got strings that anchor our cuspid valves. We labeled the bicuspid valve over here. And then there's this muscle that's attached to those strings. That muscle, this line, is called papillary muscle. And that muscle's job is to anchor the strings which also have a really horrible name. I'm going to write it up here. It's called Cordae Tendinae. Which means basically um, tendinous strings. Um, so the papillary muscle attaches to the Cordae Tendinae so that we can anchor these valves and make sure the valves don't open the wrong way. The last one of those valves names is over here on this side. It's the tricuspid valve. Okay. Um, let's see. We had already labeled the right ventricle on the preceding page. Um, this is the fossa ovalis. You couldn't see it on the preceding picture, but we had talked about it. This is the right atrium. 
You couldn't see it on the outside either. I think that's everything new that you couldn't see before, aside from the tissue layers here. So this is epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. So the tissue layers that make up the heart, essentially. Okay. Um, I'm Because I have horrible handwriting when I do that. Just look up the pictures in your book. But at least hopefully me talking about that stuff helps you understand some of it. Okay. The muscle. Again, the trabeculae cornae, muscle in the ventricles that is not attached to anything. Papillary muscle is muscle in the ventricles that's attached to those little strings, the chordae tendineae. All right, that is a good place for this particular video to stop.